Matthew 21, 1 to 17. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you'll find a donkey there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them, and immediately he'll send them. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, See, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their robes on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken, saying, Who's this? And the crowds kept saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus went into the temple complex and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple complex and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did and the children in the temple complex cheering, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus told them. Have you never read? You've prepared praise from the mouths of children and nursing infants. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, In 2004, I had the great privilege of working for John Anderson. Uh, At that stage, he was the member for Gwida in federal parliament. Uh, Let me assure you, I was probably the tiniest cog in a massive machine. Uh, John had 21 staff as uh, as deputy prime minister, as minister for a number of departments, as leader of the nationals. Uh, If you remember 2004, it was an election year. Uh, Mark Latham versus John Howard, if you remember. Uh, It was a hectic year. Uh, It was a hectic campaign period. Uh, It was a real eye-opener for a bloke like me. Uh, The schedule was relentless. Uh, It was planned meticulously. And as we hit the campaign trail, in the longest campaign in federal history, uh, there were a number of groups that had to be coordinated. Uh, There was the media. uh, There was John's close protection security. Uh, There were those who were handling policy development, and then there were those who organised the diaries and the events. Uh, Throughout the campaign, there was always an advance team, and there were people from each of those small groups on that advance team, and they were always three or four days ahead of us. Uh, They would get to a place, they'd organise events, they'd scope out the security, they'd deal with the diary details, organise accommodation, invite the local dignitaries, Then there was the team that accompanied John to the events. And then sometimes there was a team that came afterwards, all for the longest campaign in Australian federal history. It was exhausting. I think in those four weeks, John spent two nights at home. It was meticulously planned. And let me tell you, on the ground, it was pretty confronting. I was often nervous as John came to towns and communities that would need to be persuaded, that were sometimes hostile. And various moments in those towns, things were turned on their head as a local Australian politician came to town. Imagine what would happen if the Queen of England rocked up. Imagine what it's like to get the President of America to visit Australia. It takes three 747s just to get his team here. And every time they rock up, something about their arrival reveals something about them and their leadership. And what might it look like if the king of the universe came to his capital? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. 
Thank you for Matthew, uh, that outsider that was brought in by Jesus. Thank you that through your spirit you worked in him to write this good news biography for us, for, for outsiders, so we could meet the king, be brought in, be bound up, be healed, be rested, be reconciled to the one whose image we bear. Father, thank you that we can see the king coming into his capital. Thank you that we can see the way in which he exercises his authority in line with your plans. Father, please confront us today. Amen. Map point two on the outline. Our last week, as we finished that chunk in Matthew's gospel, as we came into Matthew chapter 16, uh, we heard the first inkling of Jesus' future, didn't we? I remember he was asking questions. And as they were walking around up there on the far northern border, he talked to his disciples and they recognised him. And as they recognised him as God's promised king, Jesus told them what his future agenda would look like, what the campaign trail would lead to. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed, be raised on the third day. And then he sets off towards Jerusalem. He starts walking down Israel. Along the way, he reminds his disciples and those with them a number of times what will happen, at least two that are recorded. And here they are on the doorsteps of the city, the capital of God's people, Jerusalem. And as God's promised king, Jesus has come to his base. Uh, Now, we've got to remember a few things about Jerusalem. Uh, It is actually a picture. Uh, It's a reality. It exists. It's there. But it becomes a picture in the history of God's people of God's desire to live with his mob. God's desire to live with his mob. And as the heart of that picture, we have the temple smack bang in the middle, don't we? Uh, It is a huge building. I I learned a very interesting fact this week. It covers a sixth of the city's area. That's huge, isn't it? The temple mount. Uh, It's a house there, smack bang in the middle of the capital, saying from God, I want to live with you. That's what God's always wanted to do with his mob, isn't it? It's also a house there in the middle of the capital, reminding God's people of the cost of them living with God. Because every time they come to that house, as outsiders, as sinners, as people say who say, I want to be God instead of God, something's got to die. Something perfect has to die so God and his mob can live together. Uh, It's a picture not only to his people but to the whole world that God's desire is to live with those who bear his image. But it comes at a massive cost, the cost of the death of something perfect. That's the city Jesus comes to, isn't it? Jerusalem as the promised king. Uh, His arrival is planned. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you, and once you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her, untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them, and immediately he will send them. Go ahead, this is what you'll find, get that animal, come back, everything goes according to plan. I hope you realise over the next few weeks how nothing happens by accident in this week. Nothing happens by accident. We don't know how Jesus organised this. We don't know what he had done. Perhaps he'd sent people ahead. Perhaps, who knows? But the picture's clear, isn't it? This man's planned. This man's organised. The picture is of a king who is entering his capital and he knows exactly what's going on. But they're not just planned, are they? They're prepared. Look there in verse 4. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the the foal of a beast of burden. One of Matthew's consistent themes is Jesus is not an accident. God organised this. In fact, the whole Old Testament is about this bloke turning up. The whole Old Testament, God's word, God's promise to his mob, Abraham's family, points forward to a time when this bloke, a descendant of Abraham, will turn up and will reverse the curse 
and heal the world and bring God's mob to live with him. In case you missed it, Matthew says this happened. Picking up a donkey (laughs) happened in line with what Isaiah and Zechariah said. Isaiah, a bloke who spoke God's word to God's people before they were judged and kicked out of the land. A Zechariah, a bloke who spoke as they were preparing to come back. Two blokes who spoke God's word to God's people and both of them speak of a time when their king will turn up. He'll turn up in the capital, Jerusalem, and when he turns up, there will be peace, restoration, freedom. Peace, restoration and freedom. From Isaiah, that will be salvation as God's judgment flows out. From Zechariah, that will be the bringing of peace through the removal of war. Jesus is that bloke. Jesus is that bloke. He will bring peace, restoration, freedom and salvation. But it's really important to know how this king turns up, isn't it? That was the helpful thing about what Mary said, to be able to recognise him. Do you see how you'll know him coming? What will he be riding? He'll be riding a donkey. And Matthew is very selective in how he quotes from Zechariah, isn't he? Go home and notice the words he leaves out on purpose. He leaves a number of words out. Jesus is coming in as royalty in humility. Jesus is coming in as royalty in humility. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? Listen to what he says up in verse 28 of Matthew 20. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm going to Jerusalem so that they'll kill me. I'm going to Jerusalem so that they'll reject me. I'm going to Jerusalem so that I'll hang on a cross. That's a king in humility, isn't it? Who comes for the needs of the broken. Now, the entry is royal. Go and look at donkeys in the Old Testament. Kings ride them all over the place. When Solomon is proclaimed the new king following his father David, what does he ride around? A donkey. When David returns to his city after the failed coup, what does he ride back into his city? A donkey. When Absalom wants to pretend to be king, what does he ride around with? A stack of donkeys. So donkeys are actually a sign of being royal, but a certain type of royalty, a royalty that's humble, a royalty that serves. He comes to serve, doesn't he? Not to subjugate. He comes to die, not to dominate. He comes with compassion, not crowning ambition. He binds up. He doesn't break. He heals. He doesn't rip, bust and tear. And it's not hidden, is it? It is very public. Look there at verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their robes on them. He sat on them. A very large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him, those who followed, kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The disciples do exactly as they're commanded, as Jesus planned. The crowd that is with him is the crowd that's come from hillbilly territory, up north, Galilee. They're country yokels and they've come to Jerusalem. They've been following him the whole way. His disciples put their cloaks on the donkey. The crowd from Galilee lay their robes and palm branches on the road and they sing so loudly that no one can miss them. And they sing a song from God's hymn book, don't they? Psalm 118, that's what they're singing. And when you look at Psalm 118, it's a song of victory. That was to be sung as God's king came back victorious. And they're making sure no one misses his family tree, aren't they? Did you notice that? The king is come. He's from the family of David. He is here. That's an impressive entrance, isn't it? And the crowd coming in, meet a crowd in the city, don't they? You see, I, there are two crowds here. There's the crowd coming in, those hillbillies, and there's a crowd already in the city who've gathered for the Passover meal. 
You see, it's the week leading up to the great festival celebrating the salvation of God's people, isn't it? When they remembered, when they gathered, when all of the nation came to Jerusalem to say, do you remember the day God saved us from slavery? Do you remember the day when God took us out of Egypt? Do you remember the great cost when all of those animals died and the blood was put up and the angel flew over and we were spared? Do you remember that day? They're already in the city. So you have the Galilean hillbillies coming in and you've got the religious elite here and they crash and look what happens in verse 10. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken, saying, who's this bloke? And the crowds kept saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. In Galilee, Jesus has a habit of being disturbing when he turns up, doesn't he? Remember his birth in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, when the wise men turned up and all Jerusalem was shaken? Different words, same sentiment. And the question that we were asked last week is now asked again, who's this bloke? But the crowd in the city are asking the crowd coming in, And the answers and the reaction reveals that great divide that Jesus causes. Those in Jerusalem, the religious elite, those connected with them, the vast majority of the people of God just look shocked and go, who's this bloke? Those coming in, the Galilean mob, see him as a prophet, probably a revolutionary. Their hope is that this man on a donkey will lead a war that through him the bow and the sword of the Romans will be smashed. And somehow they've both missed it, haven't they? Somewhere outside the expectation of both is the truth. Jesus is God's promised king with an impeccable heritage who has come to die, to give himself, to be humble, so that a broken world will be restored and outsiders brought in. The king has come. It's planned. It's prepared. And let me tell you, it's very perplexing, isn't it? There's no secret here. It's an obvious entrance. Jesus is now public. There's no mistake here. He's not an accidental hero. It's not a narrative that's been made up. This moment has been prepared and planned from eternity. And let me tell you, there's no idea here, is there? As humans try to remake, ignore and reduce God's promised king as he comes in. But there's ample warning here, isn't there? That when Jesus turns up, God's people should be perplexed. It happened when he was born and it's happening again when he is crowned. So before before we go further... Let me ask you that question. Has the arrival of this king unsettled you? Has it perplexed you? To deal with Jesus as he truly is, and we've seen that over the last few weeks, is to be confronted by God's king in all of his humility with a plan that is just frankly unsettling. He is born to die It's to have all of your plans turned on their head. It's to hear a king wandering around saying, repent. It's to meet the king who takes his crown from you, the one you want, the one we grasp after. It's to meet the king who is compassionate on the lost, who rebukes the proud, who welcomes and heals the broken who gives grace to those who are undeserving everything that we often subvert. Has the coming of the king unsettled you, perplexed you? Well, his entry is undeniable. I'm at point three on the outline. All of Jerusalem notices this moment. But what about the authority of the man? I mean, it's great to be able to wear all the symbols and tick the boxes, isn't it? Anyone can do that. But what about his authority? What about what he does with his kingship? Well, as Matthew describes it, Jesus immediately goes straight to the temple. 
I remember before I gave you that description of the temple, it's the Temple Mount, a sixth of the area of Jerusalem there, the great symbol of God's desire to dwell with his people and his people to dwell with him, the cost that it was going to take. And that temple complex is massive. It's organized in a series of courtyards. The outside courtyard is the court of the Gentiles. That's where people like us go. That's 25 acres. It's massive because there was a great hope that a lot of people would come (laughs) and it was reserved for all the non-Jews. In the middle of that big courtyard was a number of other courtyards. There was the court for women, then the court of the priests, then the Holy of Holies. Only Abraham's descendants could go in there. And into that central area we all know only the high priest once a year into the Holy of Holies. And when that when people came to that massive house to meet with God and God to meet with them, there was a lot of blood spilt, wasn't there? A perfect animal was killed as a symbol that you could only come into the presence of God if your judgment for sin was dealt with. And so as people came to Jerusalem from all over the world, uh, all over the Middle East, they weren't going to carry their perfect animals with them because they'd be less than perfect when they got there, wouldn't they? So they'd buy them there. And they'd exchange their money. That, that currency that they had, which bore the image of someone else, was exchanged for another set of money that could be used in the temple complex. Uh, in pay, days gone past, all of that was done outside the temple complex. But in the wisdom of God's people and the leaders of God's people and the money changers and the animal sellers, it was then 25 acres. It's empty. Why don't we put them in there? Into that quarter, the Gentiles. I mean... There's no one rocking up into that 25 acres. So why don't we put him in there? And Jesus walks in, doesn't he? Look there in verse 12. Uh, Jesus went into the temple complex. The first place he came into was that 25 acres and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers tables and the chairs of those selling doves and he said to them, it's written, my house will be called a house of prayer. You're making it a den of thieves. That great symbol of God wanting to dwell with his mob and his mob desiring to dwell with God and the great cost, that great 25 acres that said to the whole world, come and meet the one whose image you bear, well, let's turn it into a venue for venture capitalism. God's people had taken the symbol for granted. They'd made God their God and refused access to the world to him. God's people had taken God's house and made it their man cave where they could retreat to their own security, their own protection, and all others could be kept out. God's people had taken the very symbol of God's desire for the whole world to come and had made it a place where money was taken and profits were generated. But the king is here. The king cleans it all up. The king judges the people of God. The king rebukes the people of God. The king restores God's house to what it should be in line with God's desires. Come and meet God, world, and see how good he is. As he does that, some remarkable things take place. Look at verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple complex. He healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did and the children in the temple complex cheering, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and said to him, do you hear what those children are saying? Yes, Jesus told them. Have you never read? You've prepared praise from the mouths of children and nursing infants. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. When David took the city, In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 8, there was a proverb developed in Israel that the blind and the lame, literally the enemies of God's people, would never come to the house of God. 2 Samuel 5, 8. If you were broken, if you were damaged, if you were maimed, if you were a eunuch, if you were lame, don't come to this house. And what does Jesus do? Well, the blind and the lame are brought to him in the house. Did you see that in verse 14? 
and he heals them and he says, you are welcome. Come in. Come into the house of God and be made whole. And in direct opposition to the religious leaders, Jesus takes the praise of any who bear God's image. In this case, the children who sing loudly, the religious leaders would rather the kids weren't there. And Jesus says, haven't you listened to the songbook of God's people in Psalm 8? Haven't you listened to how God said those kids are welcome? In fact, I will give them a song. They are not incapable of knowing me and they will declare my praises to the world. Here in the house of God's desire to dwell with his people, here in the house that shows his people's need, the king shows his authority, doesn't he? He exercises it. He sets the house of God right. He judges the abuse of God's desire by God's people. He welcomes the broken and the damaged, making them whole. He confronts the way in which the leaders of God's people want to exclude. And he welcomes those of any age who sing God's praises. The king is here and he uses his authority. Well, he's arrived. I'm at point five on the outline. The king is here. It's open, public, planned, prepared for. It's perplexing. Yes, there are a lot of peas there. It's an undeniable event. He's come as God's king in humility to die, to bring the outsider in. That was always God's plan and it took place. But do you know what is really striking about these events as Matthew records them? Only verse 13 and verse 16 are in the present tense. Only verse 13 and verse 16 are in the present tense. It's almost as if the entry of Jesus, well, that's just there. You can't undo that. But the questions that he poses remain (laughs) constantly to confront the people of God because they're posed to the people of God, aren't they? Put simply, just as God's people were then, God's people in every age must be ready to be confronted by their king and to think about how they reflect his desires. In Jesus' day, the activities of God's people denied any access to an outsider coming in. Those who were other were excluded. Those who were blind or lame or eunuchs those who were of different nationalities, those who were broken and damaged, those who were too little were all excluded from the gathering. Don't come into the house. And the king's come and set it straight, hasn't he? That's his agenda. That's his desire. And the question is posed eternally to the people of God to confront all that they do with the desires of the king and his plans for Easter. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's so magnificent. You can almost uh, feel the dust and hear the rustle of those branches and the cloaks being laid on the ground and the crunch of the dirt and the gravel. Uh, You can hear the voices sing. Uh, It's almost as if in your desire, with your living word, we are transported there to watch the entry of the king and then to see the exercise of his authority. And in verse 13 and 16, Father, uh, the questions and the statements posed by Jesus remain constantly present. Uh, Father, as your people, we give you thanks that you've brought us in as outsiders. Uh, Father, as your people, we give you thanks that you pose these questions to us continually. Father, as your people, please continue to perplex us, to turn our agendas on their heads. And Father, please help all that we do as your people to be in line with the king who rode on a donkey to his death and to his marvellous resurrection. Amen.